Here in the northern part of North America, where I live, it is spring. Spring is springing all around us. The earth is coming back to life. The trees are budding. The flowers are beginning to bloom. And spring, for me, the beginning of spring is one of the holiest times of the year. The rebirth of life into the earth after the long sleep of winter is a holy time for me. The blooming of the first crocuses of the year is my personal new year. And yet it happens every year. And it is not the same as the holiday of Easter Sunday, which Christians around the world celebrate this weekend and in the weeks to come. It is not the same. And Unitarian Universalists, too often, too often we want to celebrate spring at this time of year. We want to celebrate spring because we see it outside. We feel it in our bones. It means something to us personally. And we decide that that must be the celebration of Easter. Too often, too often, we celebrate Easter Sunday, the holiest day in the Christian calendar, by celebrating the rebirth of spring. But the truth is that the Easter story is the story of resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And it is not something that happens as part of the natural cycles of life. Resurrection, in fact, is the very opposite of what happens every year. It is the very opposite of the rebirth of sleeping dormant life after winter. It is one thing that never happens in nature. The Reverend Francis Manley once described resurrection in our very own magazine, Quest, as something that only happens once, a radical break in the natural order of things, leading always to transformation. I believe that Unitarian Universalists focus so often on spring instead of on Easter, on resurrection, because for so many of us, this story of resurrection is so far outside of the natural order that it has ceased to be a literal truth. It has ceased to be a believable story. And what I'm trying to tell you today is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you think the resurrection of Jesus literally happened or not. It doesn't matter whether you think the followers of Jesus literally thought that his body was reanimated and brought into heaven or not. The story of resurrection, the story of Easter Sunday, still holds power for us. The story is deeper than that. It is certainly deeper than the natural cycles of things that happen every year. The power of the story of Easter, the story of Jesus' resurrection, is precisely that resurrection doesn't happen in nature. So something more incredible, something even unbelievable must have been present that morning so many years ago when Mary and Mary and Salome, it is told, arrive at Jesus's tomb to perform the ritual anointing of his body with spices and oils, only to find that he is not there. Last year, at this time, in the very first months of the COVID-19 pandemic, my colleague Kendall Givens offered a gift to her colleagues, the gift of seeing the world as Mary and Mary and Salome, standing before an empty tomb with spices in our hands and wondering what comes next. Kendall Gibbons writes, the same and real thing to do right now is to be grief stricken and afraid, knowing that the world will never be the same. 
Easter morning was like that for Jesus' disciples. It would take years and decades for them to work out what the reality of the empty tomb would actually mean for them personally and for our world, for our future. At first, the rolled back stone and the missing body was just one more indignity, one more complication, one more heartbreak to deal with. Had their beloved leader's corpse been mistreated, savaged by animals, disposed of as part of a cover-up by the Roman or Jewish authorities? Amidst all their other disappointment and grief, were they not to even have the simple comfort and closure of seeing him properly buried? The world as they had known it, transformed by the possibilities of healing, justice, grace, and freedom, blessed by God's loving compassion, evaporated as their teacher gasped out his last breath on the cross. Nothing of his bright vision remained, only the memory of betrayal and suffering and death. Kendall continues. And yet, it is in the conclusion and anguish of that disappearance, that inexplicably empty tomb, that the first whisper begins on the lips of the broken-hearted women, trembling at their own audacity. Risen? What if the story isn't actually over? What if the message still lives within us, is made real by who we are together? What if the vision he taught us is as true as it ever was? What if he is still among us, instructing, encouraging, calling on us to rise again? So today I want us to think about what is that vision that inspired those whispers, those whispers that became shouts, those shouts that became praise, that praise that became an entire religion. What was that vision? From his teachings, Jesus taught us to practice the radical art of hospitality, welcoming all into our lives, into our homes, into our holy places. Jesus instructed his followers to feed the hungry, to heal the sick, to clothe, clothe the naked, to release the prisoners, to know what it means to forgive others, however badly they might have hurt us, however horrible their sins might be, and to stop, stop seeing any other human being as our enemy, and thus to help create a world in which the human family is undivided. Jesus challenged us to change the world, by challenging the inequalities and abuses of power in it. And that challenge, that challenge got him put to death by those with power in his society. John Dominic Crossan, in his book, Jesus, a Re Revolutionary Biography, writes that to him, the very core of Jesus's teachings is one of radical equality. He writes, it was that teaching that was so threatening to people in power. One example of this can be seen in the list of people with whom Jesus shared food in the many stories of the Christian scriptures. These people include women, lower class people, and many others outside of his society's rigid and enforced power structures. Now today, this might not seem so strange, a man dining with women, but back then, who you ate with defined your respectability, and your respectability defined your standing in society, and that standing was often a matter of life and death. If you crossed the lines that society had put out before you, you were likely to be killed for it. And Jesus, in eating with those who were different from him, was basically saying, all people are equal in my eyes. All people are equal in God's eyes, and neither God nor I has any use for this society's rules, rules about gender, rules about class, rules that divide people 
that give some people power and take power away from others. I think it's important in looking at this lesson to understand that this was not something that Jesus just talked about. He didn't just give a sermon and go home, trusting that those who had listened to it would understand and change. He practiced what he preached again and again, sitting down for meals with those with whom he was not supposed to break bread. His practices were practices of hospitality, of openness, of radical equality, of deep deep challenge to the power structures, the entrenched systemic power structures of his day. Were we tr to try to follow them today, Jesus's practices, I believe, were fundamentally those of the anti-oppression and liberation work to which we are called right now, giving voice and power to those that society has deemed less than. A year into the COVID-19 pandemic, we celebrate our second Easter Sunday amidst this, this grief, this uncertainty, this unknowing. We find ourselves still standing before an empty tomb, wondering what comes next. Maybe we are afraid and amazed and uncertain our rituals have been interrupted. Our grief has been frozen in place, installed in our hearts like a permanent fixture instead of the passing emotion it is meant to be. It is up to us to decide what the next chapter of the story holds. The followers of Jesus, Mary and Mary and Salome, having found his tomb empty, did what they could to continue his work. The story of resurrection that emerged in the centuries that followed was a story that embodied the raising of Jesus's teachings from the reality of his death. It was a story created to process grief, to focus the hearts of believers on the hope that it is possible that if we indeed follow Jesus's call, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to break down the barriers that society places between people, to heal the sick, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoners, that a radical transformation, a liberation is possible in our midst. We get to start thinking about how we will emerge from the grief and trauma of our present now that there is hope that the pandemic might soon be ending. We get to think about how we, staring at an empty tomb, remembering those who have died, but whom we are unable to mourn or even properly buried, will create resurrection when the time comes to do so. We get to start noticing the signs of this resurrection, resurrection around us now, not signs of the rebirth of spring, but signs of resurrection around us now, signs of kindness and connection, signs of love in action, signs of humanity showing compassion for one another, signs of liberation, signs of us noticing the systemic injustices that have been laid bare in our presence by this pandemic. We get to notice the resurrection that is beginning to happen we get to practice the resurrection that is beginning to happen. We get to be the resurrection from death. The tomb is empty. Grief is present and palpable. Our rituals are incomplete, but hope exists. This, this is the story of Easter, the ancient story that we celebrate today.